WWJD wristband. Has anyone ever worn one of them? Uh, some of us. So they were a huge, huge um, phase um, back in the 90s and 2000s. The What Would Jesus Do wristband. I even saw a picture this morning of a celebrity wearing a What Would Jesus Do wristband. It was, I'm not going to name the celebrity because they certainly don't live as Jesus lives. Um, they were a huge, huge phase. Um, WWJD, standing for What Would Jesus Do? I even noticed as I did a little bit of research, Sydney Morning Herald published an article in 2004 entitled, Give the Ultimate Gift... It was a Christmas article. Give the ultimate gift and save a Christian led into temptation. Um, That was in 2004. Or BBC did a big big article on the whole WWJD movement uh, in 2011. And they included a number of different questions as well that sort of came out of this movement. What would Jesus drive? Um, There was a diet that came out of it. What would Jesus eat? And even an anti-war slogan, whom would Jesus bomb? Um, So, you know, WWJD, it it, it became a bit of a thing. I remember when I first became a Christian, I got a WWJD wristband. Uh, This was around 2003. And it was a a great reminder for me to ask the question, what would Jesus do in my situation if he was here living through me? How would Jesus be acting? One of the most controversial things about the WWJD bracelet, however, was uh, when I heard that from Kurong, Um, This was the most stolen item in Kurong Christian Bookstore. The What Would Jesus Do wristband. What Would Jesus Do? Probably not shoplifting. And I actually think that little story, that little picture, is is actually quite a compelling picture. Uh, You imagine a Christian standing uh, in the aisles of Kurong Christian Bookstore, looking at this WWJD wristband and thinking, gee, I'd really like that wristband to help me live as a Christian in my daily life. And I think I could get it into my pocket without the shopkeepers noticing. This, This compelling dichotomy between the desire to live as Jesus lived to do what Jesus does and the reality that often we don't live as Jesus lives and often we don't do what Jesus does. So friends, I want to ask you, how are you going? Living as Jesus lived, doing the works of Jesus. We're closing out our series this week. Uh, We've had a four-week series called Follow um, and we've been thinking about the way of Jesus. We looked at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, we looked at what it means to be with Jesus. We looked at what it means to be like Jesus. And now we're looking at what does it mean to do what Jesus does, to do the works of Jesus. Um, you might ask, are we meant to do the works of Jesus? Are we meant to do what Jesus does? And the answer is yes. In John fourteen twelve, Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Uh, We are called to be doing the works of Jesus, doing the things that Jesus does. Wow, uh, have I just gotten, has it just started to work? Was it not working before or was it just, no it wasn't, I was just shouting. There you go, that's all right. It takes a lot more than that to stop a preacher from preaching. Um... We're called to do the things Jesus does, allowing Jesus to do his works through us. We're called to be his hands and his feet. Um, and it's, it's an important reminder to us to ask that question, how am I going with that? How am I going with that? How am I going doing the works of Jesus, allowing him to work through me? The question I just want to ask today is, is how can I do that a bit more? How can I and you in our lives Do more of the works of Jesus. Allow Jesus to work through us more. What what do I need to do? How can I focus my attention? What do I need to change in order to allow Jesus to do his works through me? And I really think that if we we want to grow in our ability to do the works of Jesus, we've got to think like Jesus thinks about how he did the works that he was doing. That might sound a little convoluted. What I mean is, if we want to do what Jesus does, we need to think like Jesus thinks. Right? How did Jesus think about what he was doing? If we want to do the works that Jesus does, we need to think about what we're doing in the same way that Jesus thought about what he was doing. Right? It's got to start up here. 
And so I want us to have a look at how Jesus conceptualized of his own works, what he was doing, and hopefully learn something from him in that. So I want to jump two slides ahead. And this is the passage I want to read out and really focus on this morning. This is John chapter 5. Phil, could you jump two slides ahead? That's right. John chapter 5, verse 16 to 23. Uh, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work, at his work, to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself, but he can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. All right, that's how Jesus thinks about what he's doing. Um, That's how Jesus conceptualized of his works and we're going to grow to be more like Jesus if we think about what we're doing in a similar way. So I just want to reflect on a few things that are in that passage. The first is Jesus said in verse 17, my father is always at work. My father's always doing something. The way Jesus looked at the world when he woke up in the morning and looked out the curtains or whatever he had, sometimes he was sleeping outside, the way he looked out at the people that he met is he looked out at the world with this basic assumption that is so important to each one of us. God is at work today in the world. Repeat that after me. I'll say it one more time. You say it after me. God is at work today in the world. That was an assumption that Jesus operated from because he says, my father is always at his work. My father is always doing something. My father is always up to something. Every day, he says, to this very day, every day when I walk out into the world, I start with the assumption that God, you are up to something today. And Jesus himself says, and I too am working. That's where our activity comes from. It comes from God's activity in the world. It comes from this basic assumption that God is at work in the world today. And I think it's easier for us to join with Jesus in that assumption if you've you've experienced God at work in your life in some dramatic way at least once. At least once. Because if you've experienced God at work in your life in a dramatic way at least once, And you remember that day. Wow, I really remember when God was at work in my life that day. That day, that person said this, or that thing happened, or I felt God's presence in this way, something changed. I remember God at work in my life that day. If you have a memory of an experience where God was dramatically at work in your life, at least once in your entire life, then I think it's fairly easy to jump across to the assumption that maybe today God could do something similar either in me or through me or in someone around me. Does that make sense? If I'm starting with the assumption that God is always at work and I've seen his hand at work, then today I can quite easily come to the conclusion that today might be that day, that dramatic day where God is dramatically at work in someone else's life through me or in me or, or, yeah, in someone's life around me. I think that's where we're meant to operate from, friends. I think as Christians, if we want to do the works of Jesus, we're meant to start from a place that assumes that God is at work in the world and he could do something dramatic in someone else's life today through me through me. Are you with me? Do you get it? Yeah. Have you experienced God's work in your life, God's hand in your life? Can you remember that? Can you hold on to that? Can you say, hey, maybe today through me, God's going to do something in someone else's life? And so we're naturally asking, Lord, what are you doing? That's the question I want to teach you to ask. Lord, what are you up to? Lord, what are you doing today? God, what are you doing? 
It's a, it's a great question to ask. You can ask at any time. Any time from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, you can ask, God, what are you up to? It's a great question because it assumes that God is up to something. That's where Jesus operates from. My Father is always working. And so when you ask, God, what are you doing? God, what are you up to? It assumes that God is up to something and it assumes that he loves you enough to tell you what he is up to. That he loves you enough to tell you what he's up to. And that's this next insight that I really want to focus on. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he does. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. John 5 verse 20. I'd love you to memorize that verse. It's such a powerful verse. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. Um, in, in a, I think the, the, the context for this is the idea of the family apprenticeship. Uh, I remember um, when I was a pastor in a country town, uh, going in and visiting uh, a family who lived on a farm, and uh, I was always so jealous of the kids growing up on the farm, because they had the same experience I had of going to school, but they also got this incredible family apprenticeship on the farm. And the family that we had in our church uh, had three sons. And when I look at these sons, I just feel super jealous of these sons. It's like farm envy. Anyone else ever experienced farm envy? I didn't grow up on a farm, but I experienced farm envy. It's like, it's like you got to do maths and English and science just like I do. But then you got to go home and like, like tell the dogs how to round up the sheep. You know what I mean? Like I never did that. That's really cool. Um, and so what happened is these guys gradually grow up. Um, is there any way to get rid of that ringing? Is it, should I use a different mic? No? All right. It's not a microphone issue. Okay. These guys are like the premier guys in Australia. So if anyone can do it, they'll do it. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, farm envy, farm envy, getting back to farm envy. And now why does a father who's a farmer show his kids how to run the farm? Why? Why does a father, if he's a farmer, when they get home from school, why does he show them how to run the farm? How to round up the sheep? How to do all the different gory stuff you've got to do with sheep. How to shear the sheep. Why does he, it's because he loves his sons. He loves his daughters. He loves his kids. And he doesn't hide his trade secrets from his own children because he wants them to inherit the farm. He wants them to do the works that he does. He wants them to grow up and know how to run the farm. And the same is true for us, friends. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. That was Jesus' experience of life, that I'm in an apprenticeship with God the Father. God the Father is showing me everything he does out of love for me, and I'm growing in that relationship with him. Uh, we were in Bali last week. Uh, it feels already, you know, you know when you get back from a holiday and it's been like a week, but it feels like six months since you've been on that holiday. You know what I mean? It's like back to reality. Um, you know, we, we were just the two of us, just Joe and I. Five kids were left with my mum and we just got to spend seven nights in Bali, um, just the two of us. It was amazing. So my mum looked after five kids for seven days. So that is a challenge to all of you grandparents out there. Can you be as good a grandparent as uh, my mum was? Um, that's, that's 35 kid days, you know, seven times five. So it's quite a challenge. Um, the sound is, oh no, the sound's still there. These guys are like working on it. But again, I said like it takes more than that to stop a preacher from preaching. Um, and when we were in Bali, we ordered some lobster, ordered some crayfish. And uh, I remember sitting at the restaurant with Joe, it was on Joe's birthday, and the guys at the table next to us looked over at me like eating this lobster, eating this crayfish, and they just said, wow, you look really happy. <laughs> and I said, I'm happy. And they said, and you look like you know what you're doing. And I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I know how to get all the meat out of these little legs, and I know, I know how to do it, because when I was growing up, um, our family had a, a boat off, off Perth. Our family's from Perth. And we had cray pots. And so I have distinct memories of when I was 12 and 13 and 14 going out on the boat with my dad and pulling these cray pots and getting like 20 crayfish in a pot and pulling it up and going, man, this is incredible. Or they're all snapping away and we'd just eat crayfish for days until you got so sick of crayfish. Uh, and yeah, it was an incredible experience. And coming back to that place while I'm gnawing into this beautiful crayfish in the restaurant and remembering my father lovingly showing me and my brother how to pull up the crayfish and how to eat crayfish and how to cook crayfish. And there's something that changes when you realize that you're in a family apprenticeship. It comes out of a place of love. God is 
God the Father is, is teaching you how to live because he loves you. And so the question is, Lord, what are you doing? Lord, what are you up to? The Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. And so friends, I want to invite you again into this space of seeking out, God, what are you up to? God, what are you doing? I want to invite you into that question. It's a question that we ask with a smile on our face, with an inquisitive smile, because God loves us and he's at work in the world and he's doing something. He's doing something through us and he wants to do something through you today. Lord, what are you doing? What are you up to? So apart from just asking the question, what else can we do? To do the works that Jesus does. Hey. <laughs> you guys didn't do anything? Okay. If you're watching online, you didn't hear that. There was this ringing in our ears all this whole time. And uh, it wasn't just my preaching. It was also... <laughs> Uh, a physical thing. All right, it's gone. Hallelujah. So actually, this a- applies to the, uh, the ringing issue as well. The, the one, apart from asking the question, Lord, what are you up to today? One thing you can do um, to really start doing the works of Jesus is pay attention. And that's really what's going to be my focus for the rest of this message. Pay attention. Pay attention. In the book of Acts... Um, we see um, that, the, that Luke, the author of the book of Acts, uses the Greek word atenizo, atenizo, which, from which we get our word attention in English. He uses it 10 times. And nine out of the 10 times that Luke uses the word atenizo to pay attention, to look at intently, nine out of the 10 times he uses that, he uses it in connection with a miracle. With a miracle. I'm just going to quickly read this out. This is my summary of each of those times. Acts 1.10, the disciples look intently into heaven after Jesus' ascension. 3.4, Peter looked intently at the lame man before healing him. 3.12, Peter asked the people, why do you look intently at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Acts 6.15, the council looked intently at Stephen and saw his face like the face of an angel. 7.55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. 10.4, Cornelius looked intently at the angel who appeared to him. 11.6, Peter looked intently at the sheet in his vision. He had a vision of a sheet coming down and animals. It was a specific vision that Peter was having. Acts uh, 13.9, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at Elamas before cursing him with blindness. And then 14.9, a man could not use his feet and listen to Paul speaking. Paul looked intently at him and saw that he had faith to be made well. So the first thing I want to say, um, if, if you want to do the works of Jesus, after asking the question, Lord, what are you doing? First thing you need to do is pay attention. Pay attention. Look intently. Um, I think one of the main reasons we don't do the works of Jesus in our lives is because we're not paying attention. We're not asking the question, Lord, what are you up to? And then we're not paying attention to what the Lord might be doing. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Luke uses this phrase to look intently at when he's describing a situation with a miracle. If you notice from those passages, sometimes the looking intently happens before the miracle and sometimes it happens after the miracle. And I think one of the clearest is, is 14.9 where Paul looks intently at a lame person, uh, someone who's, who's um, disabled, and he sees that they have faith to be made well. What does that mean? It means Paul is able to, while looking physically at the person, is somehow able to look spiritually at the person. And not only just notice physically that they can't walk, but notice spiritually that they have faith to be made well. And so friends, uh, I think what Luke is saying here is that if you want to see God at work miraculously in your life, pay attention. Pay attention to what is going on around you. Ask God to open your eyes that you may see what he's doing and what are the needs of the people around you. I remember when I was first trying to learn this, uh, I was in a, in, a, in a cafe in St. Petersburg many, many years ago in Russia. 
And I was sitting there in this cafe with Joe and we were just chatting. And, and I, I was praying, Lord, show me what you're doing. And I remember noticing our waitress who was walking around waiting on our table and other tables. And I felt like God wanted to give me a word for her. I said, Lord, what is the word? And he said, I felt like the Lord put on my heart the word lost, lost. Now I was super anxious because I'd never done this before. And the waitress walks up. And I said to her, hey, I just want to say, look, I'm a Christian and I was praying about you and I received the word lost. Now, I knew it meant that she was lost, but I was too anxious to say that. I said, is there anything lost in your life? And she looked at me and she said, it's probably me. I'm lost. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I was, I was christened as a baby, but I haven't actually had any relationship with God since then. And so it's probably me. I'm probably the one who's lost. I was like, wow, thank you for doing the evangelism for me. That was, that was awesome. Like, I was super nervous and you just did that for me. That's a great deal. Um, she, and I was able to say, wow, okay, look, um, well, God loves you and he, and he wants to find you. And he's, he's available to you and Jesus died for you. And I'm going to go and get a, a book that I want you to read and I'm going to come back and give it to you. And I went and found, um, there's a Christian bookstore near there and I got uh, G, the book More Than a Carpenter, which is a great book, still an amazing book to give people who are inquisitive about the Christian faith. And I just sort of wrote in it and left it for her and, and left. And it was, it was like my first step into this space of, of being able and willing to actually talk to people that I didn't know about Jesus. Lord, what are you doing? Then pay attention. Sometimes you need to pay attention to yourself. Yesterday, I, uh, we went shopping at Macquarie Center. Did anyone else try to go to Macquarie Center yesterday? Black Friday weekend. Some of us. What about Top Ride? Anyone go to Top Ride yesterday? Was the parking as bad as it was at Macquarie? It was very bad. At Macquarie Center, I was driving around for 25 minutes without a park. 25 minutes. 25 minutes of traffic in the car park. Most of you did not try to do that. You're very wise. You're very wise. Driving around for 25 minutes and I prayed. I said, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? And I did feel the Lord put on my heart, well, I'm not making you anxious and angry. I'm not the one doing that. And I was like, okay, okay. I, you're not doing that. I won't be anxious and angry then. That's good. Because like 25 minutes of car park is enough to make you anxious and angry. But that was not the Lord, so I, I tried to stop that. And then, you know, even had a chance to give someone else the car park that I was waiting for. Um, yeah, now that I've told you, I've lost all heavenly reward of that. <laughs> Um, Lord, what are you doing? I think it's a, you, sometimes you pay attention to yourself when you ask that question. Lord, what are you doing in me? Yeah? And it's a little bit of self-awareness. Okay, you're not the one making me anxious and angry. All right, that's me doing that. Or the devil or something. But it's not you, so I'll try to stop that. Right? That's, there's something of an awareness that comes when we ask, Lord, what are you doing? And we start paying attention to ourselves. Paul says in, in Galatians 6.1, pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to yourselves. Look closely. Watch yourself closely so you don't, do not fall into temptation. That's something that we can do when we're paying attention. Lord, what are you doing? Okay, I'm going to pay attention to myself. Another thing you can do, like I, I did with this, this lost waitress, is pay attention to others. Pay attention to others. Um, we're just, we pray, Lord, what are you doing? And then we're looking at others. And what Paul experienced was that when he looked intently at others, he was actually able to see something spiritual that was going on in their life. Not only paying attention to what is happening spiritually in my life, but paying attention to what is happening spiritually in someone else's life. You've heard about EQ. EQ is your ability to understand the emotions of others. right? Well, what about for us Christians? The ability to understand the spiritual state of of others. I believe that's a spiritual gift. It's a spiritual gift that grows as we pray, Lord, what are you doing? And as we're attentive to others around us, uh, paying attention. I remember one time I was, um, I was praying at the end of a service, and uh, this is an, in another church back in Russia, and a, a lady walked up for prayer. And as I started to pray for her, I just saw her as Mary Magdalene. As she was walking up, I knew she's Mary Magdalene. And I, I thought, that's weird. I've got no idea what that means. But it was like I was physically looking at her and spiritually looking at her. And spiritually, 
because I was prayed up. I was in the Holy Spirit. I was, I, was, I was in a close relationship with God. I was ready to minister to others. I was praying, Lord, what are you doing? And I was, I was aware and willing to look spiritually at other people's spiritual state, spiritual needs. And I see her as Mary Magdalene. And so I start praying for her and I, I just prayed. I said, hey, I said to her, hey, I really believe God's saying, you know, you're like a friend to him. I thought, no, that's not enough. That's, that's not what I saw. And so I said to her, I said, hey, listen, this might sound really odd, but when I was praying for you, I really felt like I could see you as Mary Magdalene. And she started to tear up. And she said, like 20 years ago, when I first came to church, uh, the first time one of the pastors prayed for me, they said, Jesus sees me like Mary Magdalene. And then that was 20 years ago. And I've just had a bit of a time away from the Lord. And I've just come back. And now you're saying the same thing again. And uh, it, was a, it was a powerful experience for her just because I was willing to allow God to show me what he was doing. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. It's a family apprenticeship. Lord, what are you doing? I want to pay attention. I want to open my eyes spiritually both to what's going on for me and what's going on in the lives of others. And, and lastly, I want to say, pay attention to the needs of others. Pay attention to the needs of others. You know, in Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And there's something very powerful when we're, we're willing to understand that, that every person has this innate, incredible worth, and I can treat others with love and service, and Jesus himself receives that as if I'm doing it for him. Remember one time, again, this is in Russia, um, I needed, there, was a, there was a need from someone in a church, um, sort of part of our church network. I'd never met this guy. He was in hospital and um, he needed some kind of strap to sort of help him get better. I don't, I'm not a really medical guy, so it was just a strap. <laughs> but it was like a strap that cost like 150 bucks. And, um, and, and his pastor had contacted me saying, hey, Tim, I know you live near there and I know you might be able to help, but if you can, this guy needs this, this strap would you be able to buy that for him? And we prayed about it and we were able to do it. And so we went and bought this strap. And I remember I was, I was reflecting on Matthew 25 um, recently. And I said, Lord, as I arrive and give this guy this strap at this hospital, totally run down hospital, this you know, incredibly poor guy who's sick in need, as I rock up with this $150 strap, I want to experience this. I want to experience him as you. I want to experience what it means to, for you to receive this as me doing it for you. And I, I prayed that and I rocked up at the hospital and the guy came out. And I did, I experienced that. As I looked into his eyes, I felt like I was looking into the eyes of Jesus. As I looked into his face, I felt like I was looking into the face of Jesus. And as I gave him this strap, I felt like I was giving a strap to Jesus. Because Jesus receives it. Whatever you do, for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do it for me. You did it for me. Uh, Mother Teresa was once asked, Why, what motivates you to do so much for people in abject poverty? And she said five words. You did it for me. You did it for me. When we're saying, Lord, what are you doing in the world? We, we, we want to be attentive to what God is doing in us, our spiritual state. We want to be attentive to what he's doing in others. And we want to be attentive to how he sees others, how he sees others. And friends, I believe that as you do that, you will experience the power of God in your life. But I don't want to freak you out with that. Sometimes when you talk about a bit of street evangelism and things like that, you freak people out. I, uh, I arrived at a church, I preached at a church a couple of years ago, and I'd preached there a number of years before. And, uh, and uh, you know, when I, when I preached there this time, uh, a young lady came up to me after the service and I said, oh, hi, I'm Tim. She goes, yeah, I know who you are. I, I remember when you came and preached last time a couple of years ago. And I said, oh, great. She said, yeah, I remember you said that when we're on the train, we should pray about who God wants us to go up and speak to about Jesus. I said, oh, okay. And she goes, yeah, I've never done it. But I think about it every time I get on the train. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. 
I'm so sorry. I've given you this anxiety every time you get on the train because, you know, you think, oh, you're meant to be speaking to everybody about Jesus. I said, I don't speak to everybody about Jesus. I've got some stories because sometimes that really works. It happens. But, but I, don't want, I don't want to give you some anxiety of, oh, no, God might want to change the life of this person that I'm walking past on the street. And I, might, I may be the person who's meant to go up and tell them, uh, turn or burn or whatever you need to say. Um, I, I'm not saying that. I, I want to go back to what we're saying at the start. The assumption at the start is that God is working and he loves us. He loves us. The Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. God is always working and he loves us so much that he wants to invite us into what he's doing. And so when we step into a place of ministry, ministering to the others around us, being aware of what God is doing, being attentive, it always comes from a place of security. It always comes from a place of, I'm experiencing God's love and I'm allowing that love to overflow through me. So if I'm starting from a place of anxiety, I'm starting in the wrong place and what I need to do is run back into God's love. Okay, does that make sense? Awesome. I'm going to encourage you to pray and invite you to pray these kinds of words in your own uh, relationship with God. Father, thank you that you love me more than I've ever comprehended. Show me your ways. Lord, what are you doing? What are you up to? Open my eyes to pay attention to your miraculous hand at work in the world. Let me see Jesus in the eyes of those in need and give me the courage to step out in faith. And why don't I pray now? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it challenges us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for inviting us to do the works that you do. We thank you for the invitation, an invitation of love to be your hands and feet in this world. Lord, we thank you for those who are your hands and feet in our lives, that, that, that they impacted us, that they, they came into our lives and spoke the words that you were speaking. They did the things that you were doing so that we were affected and brought into the kingdom. Lord, we, we just ask that that would continue, that that would flow on through us. That's all we ask for, Lord, that your work in the world would happen in us and through us. Lord, we invite you to give us spiritual gifts that we may see what you are doing. We invite you to open our eyes that we may have eyes of faith like Paul to see the spiritual state of others, to see their needs. We invite you to let us see Jesus in the eyes of others. Lord, help us to pay attention and give us this joy, this this wonderful sense of adventure as we step out into a world in which you are working. In Jesus' name, amen.